I want to say hello to the people who are watching online right now on the Washington Note and the New America Foundation uh, websites. We have lots of – I really appreciate all, all of you who actually come live, come here live in person, because as we've begun to stream uh, our events, uh, we have very large audiences. We have people in South Korea watching right now. Uh, it's in the middle of the night, I think, uh, so insomniacs. But, uh, we, but we have a lot of folks watching online, and we really appreciate it. But it's also nice not to have to do what senators and congressmen do on the floor of the Congress when no one's in there but C-SPAN is tuned in. Um, so I do uh, appreciate it. When I woke up this morning and said, ah, it's Ron Soskind Day, and I looked out the window and saw it was snowing, I said, of course. Because uh, the last time we tried to do this, we had a, uh, also a significant storm. Uh, the snow that day stuck a bit more, but it was, uh, that was also Ron Suskind Day. And I think there was another day, um, uh, Ron, uh, who really doesn't need an introduction, but he's someone I've been waiting to sort of share some vignettes from our past with. Uh, Ron came to a conference we organized some years ago uh, called Al Qaeda 2.0. We did this with Peter Bergen uh, and a journalist from uh, Al Jazeera that was there, Yusri Fuda. Uh, we had basically all of the big time uh, Al Qaeda watchers, uh, Western and non Western journalists uh, who had interviewed uh, Osama bin Laden or Al Zawahiri, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, uh, bin Ab al Sheib, and others um, come. And, you know, I, this was. I think in 2004. So when we talked about sort of FBI watch lists and phone numbers that were probably uh, engaged, I knew that I should have been part of that lawsuit because I knew that Peter Bergen and I had to be in this because we were trying to bring in the world's experts who had engaged these people before. And early on, uh, the federal intelligence authorities were not too thrilled with what we were doing. When we did that conference, there were about 400, 500 people there. We had live C-SPAN all day. And about half the audience were from the CIA, the NSA, the Department of Justice, FBI, there, you know, in, for, to, in, in terms of learning. And Ron Suskind was there. We became friends. And we, uh, uh, and, and we called in another time when you were researching this book or the last one, maybe The One Percent Solution. Uh, in which he was doing some incredible investigative journalism, going back to some of the people that we had met there. So we've been kind of, you know, circling and weaving in and out of each other's lives. But the reason I adore Ron Suskind, besides this great book, The Way of the World, a, st a Story of Truth and Hope in an Age of Extremism, a provocative book, a book that has been in the news a lot, paperback coming out shortly, but buy your hardback version today, signed by the author. Uh, but, but if you don't know the story of Paul O'Neill, uh, early in the Bush administration. It is the moment when uh, the sort of emperor has no clothes moment in the Bush administration when someone deep inside who had been engaged in one of the power positions essentially turned out to be more honest, more forthright than anyone had ever predicted. Now that's it's hard. You can have someone like that, but then you have to have someone who helps empower and bring all that to life in some sort of rational and compelling way. Uh, you can't just have Paul O'Neill on his own. Uh, you have to have Ron Suskind. And I think it's it's a, it's very very important. And the, um, you know, the language that we make our own reality, uh, which came out of this, was another great Ron Suskind gem, gem uh, from that time. And it gave us all, I think, a very different way to begin looking at. Uh, what we were dealing with, not just with the Bush administration. I would say that, uh, to, be, to be quite fair and balanced, uh, the Obama administration also has a sense that it's making its own weather right now, its own reality, or trying to. Maybe it's having reality come back at it much faster than it had anticipated. But the notion that you're the new, newly anointed President of the United States, lots of momentum and energy, uh, the kind of inauguration we just saw, gives you a moment to be sort of a reality shaper. And there's a point at which that runs out if you don't steward uh, those forces pretty well. And there's no one uh, more important in my understanding and thinking about this than Ron Suskind's work and his friendship. So uh, without further ado, please uh, let me invite Ron Suskind up to talk with us a bit about his book and thinking, and then I hope we have a very active discussion here. So Ron Suskind. Thank you, Steve. He's got to move this way down for me, doesn't he? <laughs> The, uh, I'm sure he's still on the screen. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll be running away with the circus next week, so. Um, thank you, Steve. That was uh, lovely. Um, gracious, at least half true. I thank you for all of that. Um, it's interesting. Uh, Steve uh, is, as you all know at this point, something of an impresario around town in the marketplace of ideas. And I think uh, it's heartening. Uh, to see how ideas 
often from the bottom up, are shaping how we view the world and ultimately uh, what those in power uh, have to wrestle with minute to minute. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been an interesting period that's ending now. I, I've written three books in six, seven years since that first book, The Price of Loyalty, which which Steve mentioned, Paul O'Neill is the protagonist of that book. Certainly uh, more than 100 sources cooperated. I had 19,000 documents. And it was really about um, the era and about the ideas that are shaping the era. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, if I can sum up that book in a sentence or two, which they like you to do on book tour, I can say it's really about the process of self-governance, really not working in this period, uh, frankly. Uh, and what do we do? And how might we uh, recorrect or reorient ourselves uh, because we can't afford to have that happen. O'Neill's an old style, honest broker type. You know, he's a guy who serves presidents since Johnson, uh, Nixon, Ford, uh, even Clinton liked to have him around. Uh, you know, even though they disagreed on a lot of things, Clinton's like, you know, I just love to talk to that Paul O'Neill fellow. He just, mm -hmm. he, ch he challenges me. And, um, <laughs> You know, and, and that's what you want. You want someone who is ready for the challenge. These are complex issues. No issue gets to the Oval Office that's not complicated. That's the whole concept, the whole idea of the job. Uh, but O'Neill, as an old-style, honest broker, sort of Rip Van Winkle style, wakes up in Washington uh, in the era of Bush 2001 uh, and goes, goodness gracious, what the dickens is going on here? Uh, there aren't any honest brokers I can find. The policy process is being sapped of strength. It's, those people are being cleaned out minute to minute. It doesn't seem like they want right answers. Or they even believe you can get to right answers with the empirical model of fierce and frank debate. That was what was going on there. Now, that reality-based community quote, which is kind of, a, I think, a quote that people uh, cite a lot about this, that came from a New York Times Magazine piece that I wrote in 2004 before the 04 election. And, and it's from uh, someone in the White House. I've uh, committed to not reveal this person's identity. But the fact is, about six or seven people in the White House could have done this quote for you. Uh, it's about a thinking, a model. And as Steve says, uh, it's one that uh, has a kind of stickiness to it. Uh, the idea being that, uh, you know, in this conversation I had with this person, it was about these global news cycles. We're all part of that. You know, th circles the globe in a minute. You know, assertion, trumping fact, claim, uh, trumping authenticity, uh, you know, and off it goes. And then you're dealing with perception and only perception. And, and where is it grounded? Is there any terra firma here? And that was the discussion I was having with this uh, White House aide, uh, official, advisor. And I said, but there's still right answers, right? There's still something that we consider the best answer we can arrive at through study, search and find, staying up late, looking at all there is to know. Yeah, yeah. He's like, Ron, you see, um, let me explain this. You see, you're part of what we call the reality-based community. And I said, the what? Yes, yeah, the RBC. You had an acronym for it, an RBCer. <laughs> I said, all right. Well, if I'm a member, at least can you tell me what the devil it is? Oh, sure, sure. You believe that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. I said, yeah. Yeah, I got a history behind me. It goes way back, as far as I know. You know, empiricism, age of reason, some of these principles at the very foundation. Oh, I know, I know. But that's not the way the world really works now. You see, we're an empire now, even if it's a reluctant one. And when we act, we create a reality. Now, you'll study that reality judiciously as you will. He kind of pats me on the head, you little RBC or you. And then we'll act again. You can study that reality as well. And then we'll create a whole new reality. You can study that one too. And that's the way it really sorts out. We're history's actors because we have the courage to do what's necessary and you will be left to study what we do. Now, a lot of people have mocked the speaker here, but the fact is this is a kind of kudzu that grows right up the leg of power. When they get to the big white building, they say, we are commanding the grand forces of nature. We are sending out messages, message, message. I think this is, this is part of the dilemma, message. 
you know, Walter Pincus, who's a, one of the great reporters of this period, Washington Post reporter, Walter and I were in a panel a little while ago, and, and we're talking about the history of message. Where, where does it come from, this thing called message? Crafted and then repeated, spoken through many voices, shot out through the news portals. And Walter says, well, you know, back in the 70s, Ron, Walter's in his 70s, you know, well, we didn't have every day at a story about the president, you know. There wasn't a slug POTUS every day in the post. So if he did something interesting or important, we'd write about him, but not every day. And then uh, this uh, ingenious fellow came along, Mike Deaver, and, um, and he scratched his head, and he thought about his man, Ronald Reagan, and he thought about the 22 and a half minutes that all the nightly news programs had of hold of fill. And he says, well, let's have him do something every day. Yeah, any old thing. Cut a ribbon, smack some, you know, some auto worker in the back. Anything will do. Just give him a visual. And they did it. And every day there was that slug POTUS. Then in the newspapers, things were getting inverted. And message has grown in fullness, in breadth, to the point where a president is criticized for being off message. It's above a president, him or herself. I'm not a big fan of message, in case you're wondering. I do everything I can to get in the way of message. I, I've got a, a, a guy I've bumped into from time to time named John Lewis. I'm, most of you, of course, know who John is, especially now. John's having a pretty good couple months. He's, of course, the civil rights legend. Walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, was the young acolyte and supporter of Martin Luther King. Uh, and John says, you know, you got to just get in the way. That's, that's what I've done. That's what people need to do. Get in the way. Um, the next book, The One Percent Doctrine, about the war on terror, which came out in 2006, is about, well, if this process of self-governance is busted, what do we do now, starting on September 12th at a time of peril? A time when we're gripped with a kind of improvisational urgency. Do anything, anything necessary, just move. Well, uh, that creates all sorts of things that I think knocked us off stride in the country. Of course, the 1% doctrine is the innovation of Dick Cheney. No surprise there. But if you're in Cheney's shoes, you can't help but feel some sympathy. OK, maybe not sympathy, but at least some understanding of his position. He's getting a briefing a month and a half after 9-11 that uh, intelligence shows, and it ends up being true, that Pakistani nuclear scientists uh, Mahmoud Bashir uh, were sitting with uh, uh, bin Laden Zawahiri just three weeks before 9-11 and talking about improvised nuclear devices and how to create them. All right? Cheney hears this hair on fire briefing and he says, uh, we need to think in a new way about these low probability, high impact events. And then by the end of the briefing he has his new way. He says if there's even a 1% chance that WMDs have fallen into the hands of terrorists, we need to treat it as a certainty. It's not about our analysis or the preponderance of evidence. It's about our response. Hmm. Well, that's a doctrine. I think a defining doctrine of this period. The last book, The Way of the World, basically looks at where that idea has taken us, um, especially uh, in terms of some things that are egregious. Uh, the book, as the New York Times says in its review, has about a dozen startling, harrowing disclosures. Like all the books, there's north of 100 sources, many of them off the record. In this case, it's some on the record, too, uh, to talk about things we did as we lost our bearings, not just in terms of WMD and the mega scandal, uh, in terms of the, the march to Iraq, but, but in terms of, of the United States and its engagement with many countries, many of them our friends, uh, as well as our enemies, um, and how we um, end up, um, let's just say, uh, not relying on our native strengths. Instead, getting into the back room, where we're not very good poker players, actually. It's hard to say, but I think important. We're not good at everything. This country, I mean. 
we're good at some things. It's part of a maturation process to say, we don't do everything well. No one does. And we're particularly not, per not you know, mightily adept at playing backroom poker in South Asia, for instance. We come into table after table, and we're the fat guy with the wallet, the big fat wallet. And they all know each other. I mean, even if they seem to be on different sides, and often they are, well, that'll pass. And eventually we get picked clean and we go home. Uh, the way of the world is about how our efforts, uh, some of them producing unintended consequences, others misguided from the very first minute, have acted to bleed away America's most precious asset, its moral authority. It's interesting. You know, it's something people miss now so much that we've lost it. We've lost so much of it. It's like the loss of a limb. You feel the ghost of it. How, how did that moral authority, what is it certainly? And not that we ever were, were ideal in this realm. A lot of people write me emails and say, oh, what are you saying? We had that much moral authority? I said, well, we had more. More in previous decades, and certainly more in certain decades than we have at this moment. How do you get it back when you've lost it? That's a big part of what this book is about. It's, it's tricky, you know, especially for a nation that still has so much assembled and aggregated and collected power. Uh, power has its own dictates, its own self-protective impulses. Uh, and, um, and in some ways, the challenge is not always just what we do, but what we decide not to do how power can be controlled, how its impulses can be reined in. And certainly the brilliance of this system of government is not just the, equ the sort of lovely um, equilibria of, of the balance of how power is laid out, uh, but it's also, and I think this is a key, the self-correcting processes of a democracy how power is managed, cosseted, harnessed, channeled, controlled. And those self-correcting processes, a free and robust press, uh, congressional oversight, uh, a robust judiciary dealing with the real issues, those things have had a bad decade, all of them. Uh, some of it because those in power have innovated and developed new strategies, new ideas about how to get what they want, which is going to be a natural course of things, of self-interest, counteracting self-interest. In this case, a big part of it was a kind of innovative thinking of how to throw sand in the gears of those self-correcting processes. Let's see what happens then. Well, what happens then is we don't have controls over impulse, over some ideas that just are not sound, over, in many cases during this period, uh, violations of law, sad to say. Um, in some ways, the way of the world is recognizing at the start official misdeeds. There's many of them in, in the book. We can talk about them later. Certainly, they've gotten lots of attention. Uh, there are two investigations in Congress, one by the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, one by the House Judiciary Committee, uh, trying to get rubber hitting road on on a dozen or so disclosures in the book. But in many ways, the key to the book is how the characters, and there's an arabesque of characters that move through the narrative, how they use uh, these harrowing and dispiriting misdeeds as almost as a starting point. To say, yes, 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 I get that. But how do we go about this process of, of regaining and grabbing hold of our own moral, moral compass, we as citizens? to help guide the ship of state. Because, frankly, I think it is incumbent upon each one of us. We have a moral compass, all of us, I, I would submit, uh, Dick Cheney included. And, and the question is, uh, what does that tell us? That's what the book does. It shows some basic standards uh, that has gotten us out of hot water in the past and got us at, as best we can in this imperfect light to a bit of warmth of the sunlit uplands. 
uh, of, uh, of the just act. Um, I can say broadly, though, that, that one of the things that we're experiencing now is, uh, is a very difficult time for something that we have profited from, which is top-down command and control. It's been a bad decade for the top-down community. You know, and that goes for domestic affairs now, as we can see, as the economy collapses. It certainly goes for foreign affairs. You know, during the Obama campaign, I, I did a little writing about it right after Obama got into office. I wrote a piece for the New York Times Magazine where I sort of tried to think about what Obama meant. You know, folks would joke around that Obama is conducting a kind of insurgency in, in America, a grassroots up from the bottom insurgency, politically speaking. Uh, and certainly those in power in the Democratic Party saw this thing occurring. Here's a man with very little experience who had not paid dues who emerge sort of out of the mist. There's a key moment, which I write about in this Times piece, which I love. It's because it's so evocative. And it's in the fall of 2007. Obama is having a tough time. Uh, it's in Iowa. Uh, his whole community of fundraisers, I think Penny Pritzker is heading it. And they're all there, and they're nervous. They've given Obama a lot of money, uh, and uh, they're worried. He's 20 points behind Hillary Clinton. And Obama meets with them, and he says, Look, this is different. This is a grassroots presidential campaign. You haven't seen one of those before. You know, we have planted the seeds. We're seeing growth. It will happen. And they say, yes, yes, we've heard that. But we're 20 points behind, and the primary is not that far away. It's not working. And Obama shows then this steeliness, this steeliness that, of course, now people kind of see everywhere. And he looks them right in the eye, a whole bunch of them. He says, I never, I never told you this was going to be easy. I told you from the start this was a long shot. We're trying something new and something different. Change is hard. It is difficult. Are you ready for it to sign on? People were pinned to their chairs. And he says, look, I know you're nervous. I may not be quoting this word for word, but I'm pretty damn close. He says, I know you're nervous. If, you, if you're nervous, if you're anxious, come here. I'll hold your hand. I'll get you through this. That's a great moment of leadership there. And people wept. And they said, duh, that's it. Whatever that was, that's it. <laughs> of course, he wins Iowa, and off he goes. I'll just say one thing that's, I think, kind of interesting, though. Um, through the year of the reporting of the way of the world, I was uh, in touch with, with uh, what I call 1-800-WORLD-JIHAD. A lot of reporters like me, we have numbers we can call. You know, these are not people involved operationally with the world violent jihadist movement, but they're the sort of mouthpieces you can get on the phone. And I check in with them. Uh, through this period. I didn't put this in the book. It didn't really fit. You know, I just was interested in what they thought of the various candidates. And they were uh, pumped up about some, which surprised me. I won't get into that. But they were, uh, they were incredibly dispirited after Iowa. That day, Obama won Iowa. Uh, the next day, I, I was just on the phone with World Jihad the whole day. Oh, they were just miserable. Oh, this is the worst. This, this could not be worse. On and on. He looks like the world. He knows Islam. You know, his grandfather was a goat herder in Kenya. He will be a nightmare for us. We have had a very good couple of years. You have given us people that are easy for us to demonize. A recruitment has been at record levels. This man has opportunities that will be potentially disastrous for us. Hmm. Interesting. Bottom up. Obama did a bottom up. Now, mind you, people who are attentive to all of this are a guy named bin Laden, a guy named Zawahiri, who had lives of privilege, certainly compared to the rest of the, of, uh, the Islamic world, uh, who um, basically leave all that behind and live in a cave. They get bottom up. They understand that top-down, state-v-state, state, command and control is in trouble. Part of the miracle of so much that we have wrought in the information age. God bless it. 
Every village now wired with internet and cable. They can see us very clearly now. Go around the world, you'll, you'll, you'll feel that. We were more issues of theory before. Now they're watching us. And they're feeling invidious comparison. How is it that you have so much and I, well, no one in my village has any of the things that every one of you has. And, and you see, I, I have trouble hearing what you're saying to me now about how I ought to be. Because you see, my, my kid uh, died last year of a treatable illness. Stuff you, stuff you can get at your CVS. And I'm hungry. And you're throwing stuff away. I, I just, I didn't really get it up until recently, but now I do. So my question to you is, when does the valley rise? I think Tom Friedman, who is done admirable work is a little off when it comes to the world being flat. I think it's that communication signal that's flat, cutting across great landscapes of peak and valley. We are on the peak. Much of the world is in the valley, looking up. They're saying, well, if I'm not going to get assistance, maybe I can do some things myself. They can arm themselves now with incredible speed. They are susceptible to virulent and angry ideologies. The challenge, of course, is not top-down command and control, as the White House is learning by the hour. It is bottom-up. How do you harness the currents, the waves emanating from the bottom through the middle? We delude ourselves as to the power presidents have, which is so often why they stand up there and do their best to fake it, to fake a kind of authority that is mostly the authority of someone who sees a terrific wave and gets on it and rides it into the beach. Obama clearly understands this, but as we see the experiment of the Obama presidency unfold, to restore moral authority, to essentially redefine America's role in the world, and to solve a tsunami of top-down command and control nightmares born in the financial services and other industries by brilliant people who knew everything who are now saying, good God, where can I hide? We stand at a crossroads. The way of the world is about that crossroads. And about, at day's end, a few things at work. I'll end only with this. That inaugural speech, which surprised a lot of people. Um, some people hoping for soaring rhetoric for Obama doing the things he is so apt and able to do, to inspire, to make us feel better. Well, he didn't do it. Instead, he talked about the age of responsibility. What the dickens is that? He talked about American values, virtues, ideals, honesty, hard work, tolerance, fair play, the basic stuff about restoring those things that have always been the mark of our progress. Part of what happened is that we got off the rails on those things. It was, what does my lawyer tell me I can get away with? What's today's message? How can I, from my command and control, make things what I need them to be so I can get what I want and get home in time for dinner? That era is over. The new era emerging, this age of responsibility, is one in which not just the White House and the President, but frankly, everyone is involved in. Because as we know, the power tends to rise from the bottom in this delicious, connected, extraordinary age of information, of acuity, but also a time when small groups of people can get their hands on the destructive power that was once reserved for nations. We can't afford for it not to work, not now. And so that's the moment we're in at this moment. And so I will continue to write. Um, there will be plenty to write about. Uh, 
People ask me, do I miss George Bush being gone? Uh, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> he and Cheney, <laughs> I say no to that, but boy, oh boy, they, st they do uh, still take up ink in that news cycle, don't they? Cheney can't seem to stop talking. Um, and, uh, um, and I think that, frankly, uh, this period and what uh, was tried um, for better or in many cases for worse during this time will be something that, frankly, we do argue about for the next 20 years, a little like we argued about Nixon. Uh, so um, I think we'll have a lot to talk about. Thanks. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Let's, uh, let me open the discussion here. We'll let you continue to, to uh, have the mic here, Ron. Uh, let, me, let me open and I'll invite other people to sort of comment or, or ask questions. But uh, I wrote a piece on my, uh, on my personal blog, The Washington Note, suggesting to Obama, it made a lot of my readers upset, by the way, that the most important person that Obama could learn from in the Bush administration was Dick Cheney. And my logic ran this way, that no one knew how George Bush made a decision, whether he talked to God, talked to Laura, he was inconsistent. You really don't have, even to this day, a very good read on what drives Bush one direction or another. We got the swagger part, but not much else. Colin Powell mattered a lot when he was in the room and mattered a lot when, didn't matter a lot when he wasn't in the room. Uh, Condoleezza Rice had about six close followers, but Dick Cheney was able to both bring a lot of people into the national security bureaucracy and to convey, whether it was economic issues or national security issues, a, a kind of telegraphing of what Cheneyism was so that you didn't have to get a snowflake memo like Rumsfeld had to send. You sort of knew his approach to the world. You knew how he would do things. Not a lot of uh, obscurity there or opaqueness about how Cheney mm -hmm. thinks about yep. the world and so yep. people could follow him. My worries about Obama, in the way you've described him, uh, and as he's come in, is that he's become a very confusing character. We don't know what he stands for. I don't know what the ten, you know, principles of Obamaism are. I have lots of friends that were on the transition team uh, who were, whose job was essentially to look at in institutions and sort of ask themselves how they could be rewired to fit the Obama change agenda. And honestly, today, when we've seen the various moves he's made, the appointments he's made, some of the, the uh, uh, concessions he's made, he's confused everyone. And I wonder, are we back at a Jimmy Carter moment where fundamentally, yes, I mean, he's a mesmerizing and fascinating, captivating character who's injected himself into every conflict in government. And you'll find uh, what I, I think is the real Achilles heel of this administration is a belief that they've got the ability to uh, navigate all of these challenges with, and that they, they have a conceit that they don't think they'll be overwhelmed by the crises that are hitting them, that they'll be able to handle it all with some sort of uh, uh, management process that I, you know, you and I haven't seen yet. But I, I'm just, one, I want to bring, I mean, I want to bring it down a little bit mm -hmm. to, to the question of when it comes to the practicalities of making a government work so that it actually delivers. I, I tell people I feel like we've replaced the housing bubble with an Obama bubble. And I, I, I'm interested in whether you think this is a, a real problem for them or not. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, I think we can safely say it's a great point that, that Cheney uh, is, um, is one of the last great uh, sort of avatars, emblems of top-down command and control. He's from that world, that era, uh, saying we are going to hold the line. Um, we're going to make decisions for good reason, bad reason, or no reason I'll let you in on. Uh, and we will be judged on our actions. Uh, and, um, and the fact is, is that uh, uh, what you found it, when you look at, at what occurred is, um, is that they weren't thorough. They didn't sort of uh, uh, engage in, um, in the sort of a due diligence of search and find. So they were often making wrong decisions. They were moving on their gut. I think Cheney moved on his gut often too. He ordered the thing the way he wanted it, and he says, I'm going to pretty much guide this ship as I, as I see fit. Now, the challenge to Obama certainly is, is, um, is uh, the pendulum swing. Uh, you know, because the fact is, is that I, and I think it's early because he's having to deal with an economic crisis, and I think in some ways the character of Obama uh, and this administration is probably going to be, um, you know, five, six, seven months along before we get a real sense of it. But, but clearly, you know, a concern um, is 
um, is priorities um, and a willingness. Because I mean, people have talked about that before. You've got to set priorities. You've got to do them in a certain order. You can't do everything at once. Even though Obama said and others during the campaign, you've got to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Well, that's true. But the fact is you've got to be able essentially to say, this is my priority. We're going to do this first and after that and after that, you know, this will come up. And, and what's fascinating now is as they get their arms around these significant issues, uh, I think they are able, this gives, gives me some hope, to arrive at what I consider best answers based on the, in, in the empirical model. You know, they are bringing in competing voices. You know, it's a little bit more like the Clinton administration, though I think it has more discipline, to say, here's what's known and knowable, all right, and what do we do going forward as the next thing? I mean, I think they have that capacity. The, the, the question, though, becomes whether or not they'll be able to muster the kind of fortitude it takes to, to fundamentally restructure big parts of the United States government. I mean, this is going to take a kind of clarity and, in a way, a kind of courage, a kind of forcefulness, tactically uh, as well as intellectually, to say, you know, guess what? You're public servants. I appreciate what you've done up to now, but what you are ordered to do and constructed to do is part of the 20th century. The world is changing. It's changing fast. It's already changed. We're going to need a whole different way of doing this or that. What that's going to mean is Obama and company are going to have to take on vast interests that define the town, where people's you know, salaries and pensions are at stake. Uh, my goodness, you don't need Steve or me to tell you how folks can really dig in when it means their paycheck. Uh, Obama's going to have to do that in terms of both foreign and domestic affairs, and he's going to have to be right. He's going to have to be right early. Or those who simply say, my job is just to be immovable. I have to do nothing. I just have to be dead weight. Try to move dead weight sometime. Someone who just goes limp on you. It's almost impossible. That's the threat that Obama faces. And, and ultimately, it comes back to something Paul O'Neill and the old process people say. Good process creates good outcomes. That's why right now or early, everyone's looking at how is this process constructed? How is Obama managing it? White Houses channel their president. Right? So, so as Obama shows himself, which he's done a little of, and I expect he'll do more of going forward, especially on these issues that he prizes, this age of responsibility virtues, he hopefully can challenge and channel through the vast White House staff and the executive and federal bureaucracy so that he gets what, what the, the process people call a scalable solution. Their dilemma, can one single individual manage something as vast as the behemoth of the federal government? It's a beyond human scale problem. The key is you've got to show through the power of your example the basic foundation of what you believe and how you believe it is attainable. And then others will begin here and abroad to say, I got it. Great. Thank you. Let me open. Uh, Danny Mandel. Um, yeah, it seems to, I mean, I'm, I'm You're oh, talking to the oh, mic sorry. so the folks Hi. on the web can. Danny Mandel, New America Foundation. Um, it seems, you, you seem to suggest that you believe that, o, that Obama or at least you hope that Obama can enact these changes within the existing institutions. Um, I'd like to know to what extent you think that a lot of the, that the changes that are necessary that you've been talking about can happen through existing institutions or whether we need to in think of entirely new processes in order to bring about some of the fundamental changes. I think that it's the latter. I think it's entirely new processes must be created. Uh, the fact is some of those institutions will be able to dance and spin and pirouette and they'll survive. But ultimately what it comes down to is to use the horsepower available to think in, in rather bold new ways about what the purpose of the United States government is. I mean, for instance, let's just go down the list. I think he needs to essentially reinvent the intelligence community as it stands. It's built for the state-to-state -state dance of forced diplomacy and, you know, and stealing information. That period is not over, but it has been challenged, and it's eroding. All, all across the world, we have battles where states cannot control the non-state actors within their borders. 
All right? And we're trying to encourage states in a kind of states altogether versus non-state actors altogether to say, what do you need so you can do what you need to do? As opposed to looking clearly at the vast bottom-up growth of the non-state actor to say, how do we manage to interface directly with the non-state actor, with that community, lead other states, innovate, Financial services, the way the United States deals with so much of the U.S. economy. I wrote about this in The Price of Loyalty. There was an amazing moment, which you can draw up. I wrote a column in the Times uh, editorial page about this, where, where O'Neill and Greenspan and other sort of wise heads, older guys, were sitting around after Enron and Global Crossing, you know, and, and, and all the nightmares in early 2002. And Bush, I think in a kind of throwaway, says, look, O'Neill's a tough guy. He was chairman of Alcoa, President Alcoa. Have him run a thing about reordering how corporate America works. That was the kind of concept. So, um, uh, so, so off he goes, and O'Neill's angry, because he's an old school, stick in the mud kind of guy, and, uh, in a, and I think in a kind of admirable way. But, uh, and so he gets Greenspan in the room. They've known each other for 30 years, these guys. They're best friends. And he sort of gets Greenspan poking him along to say certain things that Alan probably wishes he could take back. But it's in a room of a lot of people. Harvey Pitt's there, sort of young guys, regulators, you know, sort of masters of the universe. And O'Neill and Greenspan are reminiscing, interestingly, about the day when equities were judged on an old sleepy thing called a dividend. <sighs> when was that? I was in high school, right? And they talked about the groundedness of that. You know, they were grumbly, you know, like crusty old guys. And, you know, well, and, you know, well the thing was is that that dividend check would come. And you had a decision as an investor. Do I go buy a washer dryer or do I invest it back in the company? Because I, I think what they're doing is something I want to stick with. Now, I've got the money in my hand and I'm going to make a decision. Now, over in the corporate suite, they had a big decision too. What do I pay? with the needs I have, the new factory, the executive bonus, what do I pay as my dividend? Before the era of perceived value and that magic word valuation, right? These are fundamental things that drive the U.S. economy that need changing and it's going to take force and Obama's ultimately going to have to say either you're with me or get out of the way because you're going to get rolled over. They've got to be both right, and they've got to be politically sound. Let's get the mic to people so folks can hear. Uh, this gentleman uh, back here, and then we'll go here. Uh, Eric Villard from the U.S. Army Center of Military History, and this is a question uh, requiring some speculation about uh, the global war on terror. Yeah. We still use that term in the Army. I think it's on its way out. I don't know what's going to succeed it, but uh, my question is, what do you think is going, it will evolve into, and to what extent do you think that that evolution will be driven by the personalities of Obama versus the financial realities that we're facing now. You know, to what extent was the war on terror a luxury we could lo no longer afford? Can, can I ask you just one quick question? Yes. In, in the material literature, in the commanders you have, are you noticing a rollback of, of the use of the GWAT? In, uh, in it's a too, too soon. It's, it's, it, it's, things move at a pretty glacial pace. I think what you're going to probably wait is have to see another two years before you get a turnover, maybe Army Chief of Staff, new manuals come out. Then there will be some decision on what to call it if it's not still GWAT. We love our acronyms in the Army. If it's not GWAT, then what is it going to be? Uh, that's an evolving thing. But you see rumblings. You see rumblings. You know, I, I think that, you know, the, obviously the Brits don't use it anymore. I think many people in the U.S. Uh, are probably looking for a replacement therapy here, a replacement term. Uh, you, you know, well, ultimately what we're dealing with, is, as we've talked a little bit about, is, is a, you know, is a very, very different model. You know, again, in some ways, the victories that the non-state actors and, and the, uh, the terror networks have won, it, it's not anything really anyone did. It's just the, the way history has marched forward. You know, uh, what, what would Metternich or Talleyrand do at, at a moment like this when small groups of people can, can get their hands on the destructive power that, that was once the province, the reserve of states? Where do you begin? You know, and ultimately, 
I think we are going to find a replacement. I think that's one of the questions now in Afghanistan and why some people are troubled by the announcement of 17,000 more troops, a 50 percent increase over the 36,000 we have there. I was in Kabul in, um, in late 2007 in December. I, I saw Dan McNeil, who was the ISAF chief at that point, and general, and, and we're at the ISAF headquarters, and we talked about this problem of, of not really being a military solution. Uh, in Afghanistan, even with, you know, let's just say many, many more troops than we have now. You know, they, there's a lot of talk about the lawnmower effect. You cut the lawn and it's growing right behind you. Yeah, you know, and ultimately I think we don't have a solution there, which is why people have right now some pause about upping the boots on the ground, you in the military or, or others in the military included, saying, what is our strategy? Where does this lead? You know, is there something that's going to work here? I think that we are slowly but surely, though, figuring out that we're dealing with a kind of array of, for lack of a better term, either regional and or global insurgency uh, movements, you know, that again are bottom up. Uh, they are very difficult to deal with. Uh, they're very difficult to challenge head on in a traditional boots on the ground way. You know, if you're putting, you know, uh, young men and women carrying uh, automatic weapons in civilian populations, whatever your ideas were, as you leave the fort with the flags waving, they're going to be gone pretty soon when the first, you know, house of women and children is slaughtered and then the second and then the 50th. You know, and, and I think the key, especially now in this sort of era of instantaneous communication where we have to think it's, it's persuasion, we need to be apt and smart in persuading people to say we are a force for good and our model is one that works. How do you do that? You know, it's interesting because the futility a lot of the commanders feel in Afghanistan is one that, that you see a little bit of a, of a kind of, well, what's that about response? When you look at just your one thing that I mentioned in Way of the World, which I thought was fascinating, is, is uh, we were down in the teens in terms of the United States' approval ratings in Pakistan. Uh, uh, you know, through 2004, 2005. Uh, then, of course, there's the Kashmir earthquake, all of that thing that we do well. Again, what do we do well? That's one thing we do well. We're good at building stuff. We're good at sending people to do good works. You know, we got great strength there. Doing the right thing, asking nothing in return. That's one of our strengths. Marshall Plan, even though there were some transactional parts of that, that's basically what that was. Absolutely, and, and they should go and read George, and they should read Craggett Hill, he writes at the end of his life. I mean, George is trying to yell out, saying, this is what I've learned. You do the right thing, you ask nothing in return. What are you saying to those people in far off parts of the world? We see you as our peer. We're not doing bait and switch. We're not saying, I'm going to save your life, but you need to sign here, here, and there. We're saying at some point, if you bend toward us, that'll be your choice. Now, ultimately, that Kashmir earthquake, after all those humanitarian workers get there, the U.S. approval ratings in Pakistan go up to 48 percent. Bingo. Three months later, we bomb some, some sort of uh, improper spots in the tribal areas based on bad intelligence, which is virtually all of our intelligence in that part of the world, and we're back down to the teens. What does that say? It says that certain things actually do work. When you go to the tribal areas, when you go to Pakistan or Afghanistan, like I do in this last book, you say, what would be helpful? People say very basic things. Water, that would be good. Electricity, I'm big into that. A school, stuff you can get at the corner drugstore. All of those things would help us see you maybe differently. Now, not immediately, but soon enough. And what does the Army do? And what does that $700 billion Pentagon budget go for? Ultimately, what I hear from those on the ground, and they're not just folks in Afghanistan or Pakistan, but some of the smartest folks in the military, they're like, well, you know, actually, you know, so we do those things. Well, the hospital's going to get blown up twice and then the third time, and the Army's mostly to protect the good works. That's what they're there for. Well, after the third time the hospital's blown up or the water plan, all of a sudden the people slowly start to say, can I help out here? This is who you need. He lives over here. You know, can we get in on this? We really like the water. And my kid didn't die. Um, I'm ready. It takes patience. It takes a view of the limits of force. Finally, I'll just say this. If there's any lesson we've learned in the last several decades, it's that especially in the modern world of instantaneous communications, of the ability of individuals to carry firepower, 
top-down command and control, i.e., you can't hold a, a territory against the will of its population. It's not working now. What do we do then when we've got an entire system based on the fact that that is doable? You know, I want to go to this gentleman here, but along the lines that Ron just said, it's an interesting vignette. It's a little bit out of left field, but it does sort of frame some of the things Ron's saying, particularly about the Kashmir earthquake. Uh, a lot of folks don't know this, but what's interesting, we, set, we had one major base camp. This is a really horrible region, very difficult to access, and very, very fundamentalist area. In, in, in fact, one of the problems is that women particularly with post-traumatic stress, et cetera, there couldn't be treated by men. And the Cubans, uh, believe it or not, which didn't have diplomatic relations with Pakistan, had 17 base camps of doctors deployed for a full year there and now have uh, diplomatic relations with Pakistan and did this. And it's, you know, part of the, you know, Cuba is producing a lot more doctors than revolution nowadays. But it's a very, very interesting sort of, and they worked with, the Cubans there worked with the American doctors and the European doctors that have been in, uh, in, in this area. Um, but, you know, even though it's a microcosm, mm -hmm. a much smaller country that we don't talk too much, the Cubans were able to basically turn this into a real diplomatic success in various fronts. They didn't see it at the time. I mean, thinking about Cuba and Pakistan is sort of out of left field to begin with. Mm -hmm. But then you also then look at the di another contrast down in, in uh, uh, South and Central uh, uh, America, not just in Venezuela, but both bringing doctors into training in Cuban uh, health universities and then send them back to rural regions. Whereas the United States sent a very large ship, painted it white with a big red cross, USS Comfort, to do about 80,000 or so uh, um, consultancies with people that had health problems that would come to the port, whereas the Cuban doctors were sort of deeply deployed and all this kind of, sort of the Peace Corps type, mm -hmm. type approach. But it's, it's, you know, this is a modern day vignette of what poor countries are doing as they outreach to each other, mm -hmm. creating and consolidating diplomatic successes as states, right. uh, dealing with some of the non-state actor trends. And it's just something to throw in line of, you know, along the lines Ron said. But yes, yeah, sir, right yeah. here. Microphone? No. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Hi, my name is Andrei Sitov. I'm uh, with the Russian news agency Tartas here in Washington, and uh, I have uh, three questions for you, but I, I can't resist. Uh, Pick the best from, one. From uh, mm -hmm. commenting. My brief comment is we lived through this. Uh, my feeling is we lived through this under Gorbachev. Uh, not every change is good change, uh, regardless of what young people may believe. <coughs> uh, you, you better be careful about what, you, uh, what change you wish for. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> what what kind of change uh, Obama may or may not be able to achieve. Uh, my questions, uh, which are different, is uh, about this uh, moral uh, uh, moral responsibility that is uh, sort of that I see as uh, the guiding light in, in what you do and say. Uh, <clears throat> Do I understand you correctly that you want uh, Bush, for instance, uh, to be held accountable uh, for what he did? Uh, you mentioned there are a couple of uh, investigations uh, on the Hill about that. How, uh, how would you want them to, to end? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, and I've, I've said this uh, repeatedly. I, I, because of the length of his answers, yeah. put all three on the, uh, yeah, uh, the docket, because yeah. right. we can't I'll go back all together, and forth. Yeah. I'm sorry. All right. Okay, so, Truth Commission, uh, got so, that one. Right, uh, the, truth, uh, the Truth Commission, then if, if he is supposed to be morally responsible, then how do you uh, make a distinction between a personal responsibility of a leader and the responsibility of a nation? in okay. the eyes of the right. outside world. See that, I see Thank that you. one. Uh -huh. Okay, Thank and, you. And uh, lastly, uh, do, you, uh, do you feel that in the current crisis conditions, uh, the uh, uh, moral code is disintegrating here uh, quicker than it used to? Thank you. Okay, that's, a, that's, I can do that swiftly and I'll try to keep my uh, answer terse. Um, the, um, I think there, there is movement now for this Truth Commission. Uh, Leahy and others are pushing forward. I, I think it's a, a good idea. I'm not sure if it will lead to prosecutions or not, but the fact is it's an important step wherever it leads. Uh, you know, uh, I'm of the mind that, that you don't repair uh, one's uh, moral energy, moral authority, by saying that was then, this is now, full steam ahead. 
Uh, the fact is if there are violations of law, we are a nation ruled by laws and not men. It is part of what makes America exceptional. And, and the first thing to do is to, well, for an individual or a nation to say, here's what we did that was wrong. Here's what we learned from it, and here's what we will not do again. That's just basic life lesson. And I think that we need to do that broadly as a country, and I think much of the world wants us to do that. They still have a view that the United States uh, uh, can act as uh, a powerful example. I'll just say this sort of briefly, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, when I go around the world, a lot of people ask me about Watergate still, decades later. At the time of, the, of Nixon's resignation, there were many people in the establishment here in Washington uh, who said, oh, the country will seem feckless and directionless, and the president is laid low and leaves the White House. Well, in fact, what's the lesson that the world got from that? Lessons that were important in the battles that were to come, including the fall of the Soviet Union, which is why I mention it, is people say, now let me get this straight. In this country of yours, the President of the United States is no different than a guy rolling a garbage can on, on Pennsylvania Avenue in the eyes of your duly constituted laws? Amazing. How does that work? You know, that is the way moral energy flows, and that's what I think we need to be thinking about now. Uh, Mike Olshausen, I'm sorry, we've got to work around the room. Yeah, Mike? Yeah. yeah, thanks. I'm Mike Olshausen, Contemporary Review. Um, unless the CIA has been freelancing again, uh, the uh, last three predator strikes would have had to have been signed off on by the new president. Um, there doesn't appear to have been a wedding party among them so far, but maybe that'll come yet. What do you make of that in terms of the new president? Hmm, that's a great question. I, I think it is, they were certainly signed off by the president. That's part of his job, um, you know, uh, hopefully. Um, the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, I think the predator strikes are of, of limited value. Uh, I think that, um, you know, the kind of fire from heaven model uh, is often uh, one that, um, uh, you know, ends up being uh, uh, misguided and random. Uh, and if you look at the long history of them, they're born largely on imperfect intelligence, uh, and, um, and everyone can see that frankly. Uh, you know, we uh, create uh, some hits, there's no doubt, uh, but in many cases victims, uh, and, um, and it is used understandably against us. Uh, you know, I, I think this is exactly the kind of model of maybe trusting force uh, too much and not building the capacity uh, to grow human intelligence assets, which really comes from the broader issues. Of, of moral energy. All the folks who were in the battle with the Soviets over the years, Richard Dearlove says it in this book, he says the key was is we stayed, not always perfectly, but in general, on the moral high ground. And that's why over time we got moles, we got intelligence, and we ended up winning that battle of the cross swords between Washington and Moscow. Now it is no different. The key is building intelligence assets so that we if we get the shot, it can be better targeted, uh, and, that, um, and that ultimately it's the eyes, those new eyes, as Proust says, that we don't have that will guide the point of the spear going forward. Gary Mitchell. Uh, Ron, thanks. Uh, Gary Mitchell from the Mitchell Report. And I want to say that I, 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 Steve's opening comments and question, um, uh, I, I, I felt a lot of sync with what he was saying. Sort of, until getting to the sort of is this Jimmy Carter, and I want to, I want to try another, <laughs> another um, avenue and see whether this, given all the reporting that you've done, not just here but but prior to this, has any resonance at all. And it be, it begins with that you know that apocryphal story probably of John Stuart Mill realizing that some of his best thoughts came in the middle of the night, and when he'd wake up in the morning, he couldn't remember what they were, so he puts pen and paper by his desk and sure enough the first night he does that he wakes up and he scratches something and when he when he gets up in the morning he looks at it and it says think in different terms and my question to you is I mean following the, the logic that Steve lays out which I think is important it, is it possible number one uh, that what we have here in the 44th president is somebody who genuinely thinks in different terms. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, not in the terms that we are used to seeing in the other 43 faces that, that hang on the wall, but from places like Gandhi and King, et cetera, who are sort of bottom-up, mm -hmm. grassroots yeah. kind of thing. And A, and B, uh, if that's true, and I don't mean in the, in the purest sense, but directionally, mm -hmm. if, if that is true, um, is it possible for that way of thinking, if we, we know that it's possible for that way of thinking to get elected. The question, it seems to me, is it, it, given all the other uh, components of the, of the polity, uh, is it possible um, if, if that, that model is true, is it possible um, that he and we can be successful? I think that to differentiate Obama from Carter, uh, you know, considering what Steve mentioned and you bring up, is is they're they're very different. I think in their basic construction and their in their ontological makeup. I think that that Obama, everyone who has spent time with them way back to Harvard Law School, talks about how what a brilliant listener he is. How he would sit in the back of the classroom. Someone was telling me recently, um, and he would just wait as everybody sort of held forth. And then Obama would say, "Hmm, well, there's a little of this and that, and here's what you really mean. And I think this is the way we go forward. Not though, just in a way to create a kind of Cuisinarded model, but to say now we move forward in this way. That will uh, will accrue very well to him in the current job. A B, I think." Uh, again, by his basic passage to this point, you can see he is speaking in different terms. He certainly did politically. You know, and in, and in some interesting ways, Obama, I sort of say this half in jest, but Obama is a non-state actor. We have one as our president. You know, he, he, he lives in many countries. You know, he, he really comes to America in a way and embraces it with ferocity. And on Inauguration Day, they adopt him back with a roar. It's an extraordinary saga of a nation and an individual. And, and I think by virtue of, of that occurring, and people in Kenya or Indonesia adopting him as well as they're adopting him all over the world, from the bottom up, mind you, some states are quizzical. What's he going to mean for me and my power that I've accrued probably illegitimately? No, that's different. We're talking about from the bottom up. That's where the power is. Obama thinks clearly in these terms. Will he be able, though, to guide the beast, the federal government, of so the did, world's so most did, powerful nation. So did Huey Long. Well, <laughs> Huey, P, Huey P. <laughs> I don't think Huey P. had the conceptual capacities <laughs> of our man Obama. Uh, but, but um, you know, and I think, in fact, Obama has the touch. And I think he needs to probably now remember uh, that this is what brings him to the party, is that bottom up, that swell. I was in Manassas the last night of the campaign at that extraordinary rally, 90,000 people there, way out on the edge here, folks with gun racks and a wildly diverse crowd, actually, not just the Northern Virginia, you know, political government types, they came from all over. And Obama stood up there, last speech, after 21 months, you know, boy, the sky lifted up there. He really managed it. That is probably what he needs to be thinking about more now. You see, because right in the middle, You've got this, this, again, this beast he needs to own, governance, right? The fact is they've built all sorts of bad habits. You know, there's a lot of kudzu growing up their leg. They've got plaque. They've got hardened arteries. He's going to have to make them either change or vanish, okay? The key, though, is he needs to speak over their head at the same time he talks directly to them, to the vast hurly-burly, to those out on the horizon line who essentially are saying, go, go, do it. I'm with you. He's got to keep them with him. That's where the power comes from. You know, it's going to be very difficult, and if you live in Washington like I do, and if Obama does what's needed, you are going to hear screams of pain. I joke around. My, I've got a kid who's now at Penn State, but, uh, you know, when he was younger in my neighborhood, just like where Steve lives, you know, you got journalists and lawyers and lobbyists, and the lawyers and lobbyists are pretty much the same thing. So, uh, and he sort of is asking what so-and-so across the street, some dad of a friend of his does. He said, well, he's a lobbyist. 
It's like, what's that? Oh, geez, you know, I didn't want to really be too frank with him. Um, <laughs> because he's a nice guy, this fella. Uh, but I said, well, you know, it's complicated. Uh, uh, what happens is that when a, a collected, assembled American interest in this country, healthcare, automotives, just pick one, energy, uh, when they're challenged by the dictates of the common wheel, of the greater good, by a political leader, in our town, uh, all of a sudden you see people building additions on their houses and new cars in the driveway because the money flows right through those lobbyists to make sure I don't get hurt, my industry, my people. The challenge that those people present to Obama, quiet, steady, in some cases pernicious, will be daunting. So we are dealing with an experiment in leadership. Folks, I know there are a lot of questions, and we're, I want to give folks an opportunity to get the books and to uh, one, engage one, one. Ron. We'll take Diane right here, and uh, uh, but we'll 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 continue afterward. But you can talk to Ron at the table, and I have a comment I'd like to make right after Diane. Okay. Go ahead. All right, this relates. Uh, you, um, doing Diane that. Perlman. I'm a Keep political psychologist interested in conflict transformation. Um, well, you mentioned vested interest, including the military, and certainly Cheney and the gang used a lot of fear, manipulation, and a worldview of like good guys and bad guys and going after bad guys. Right. So o Obama, I see him as sort of between the old paradigm and the new paradigm, and some of the confusion you talk about and some of the concerns are like sending more troops to Afghanistan, and, and he has better language. Um, but also, this, there's a body of knowledge that's not very well known. And just to use um, Iran, as an example, since some of the best thinking on that has been presented in this room by uh, Hillary Mann Leverett and Flint Leverett. Say there are two basic approaches, and I'm concerned, you know, he says we're going to talk, but what he means by that is we're, uh, we can't let them get nuclear weapons and we're going to insist. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of going to be really nice with a smile. We're going to make them do what we want with mm -hmm. carrots and sticks, which are right. also humiliating forms of control rather than the grand bargain or where you change our relationship yeah, yeah. with Iran so that they're not a threat yeah, right. that way, which is more stable. So I don't think he's, like with all different conflicts, yeah. I don't think he's quite there yet. And I also wonder if, any, if you think he, there might be people behind the scenes pressuring him. There are people all, all over the place pressuring him in different directions. He's not yet, I think, articulated the way forward on a lot of these areas. I think that Obama probably is thinking, as I think most smart people think, you have a choice. You can either kill or co-opt. And the fact is, is that with populations who are also watching carefully what goes on, pretty much Obama's view, I think this is accurate, he says everyone wants a better life for their children wherever they live. All right. How does that happen? doesn't have to be leaps forward, but steps forward. If I can manage to be the person that in conversation, because I'll talk to anybody, that doesn't diminish me any, as a bringing the, the possibility of that step forward for populations in parts of the world, then their leaders, many of them not duly elected and many of them illegitimate, then they're in trouble. That's the way it really works now. If a population starts to say, hey, I like that guy and I like what he's doing, what's going to happen is the top-down command and control of various leaders in various regions of the world is going to be challenged from the bottom up. That's, I think, the broad plan there. So, um, I, I want to thank Ron. You know, all of his books stretch out my mind, make me think. And, you know, as a guy who both, you know, in my case, is someone who writes but also does try to be an ideas impresario or try to be a venture capitalist in the world of, 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 of public policy entrepreneurship, it is a tough time in a way. I mean, I don't feel like, you know, the uh, world jihadist talking to him, but Obama is an interesting challenge for people like me because I am one of these people put off by hype, by put off by the big, I mean, I am, uh, hope is something I'm not very good at. You know, I used to run the Nixon Center and I tend to be a cynical, disaggregator who counts on the worst, who hardly believes in peace. I'm much more of a believer in equilibria. And, and, but I come at this, and I sort of remember this Tom Tolles cartoon in the Post on November 5th with a black man with a suitcase walking up to the White House with the Declaration of Independence. And it was, you know, clearly I was moved by that. I continue to put it on my blog now and then. And I, and I, and I do think that the United States 
skated for a long time on the mystique of being a superpower while letting a lot of the substantive elements go. And Iraq and many of the other um, decisions that the Bush administration took so undermined this mystique or moral order, uh, moral leadership, that it's really dramatically harmed us. And I hope that Ron is right. I continue to actually write as if Ron is probably right, that there are things the United States can do to get back to having a kind of constructive leverage in the world that's positive and that can create a cycle of mutual confirming, mutual consolidating positives because it's very, very hard to get out. But I think the chances of success are really low. And when I look at what's going on in the economy, I look at what's going on in the world, I sort of feel that the United States, frankly, is going through what uh, uh, I think you were loosely referring to what happened with Gord is the you know, the United States somewhat modeled itself in competition, no matter, it's not a question of moral equivalence, but a question of, of uh, structural similarity to the Soviet empire. And I have a feeling that a lot of this is collapsing now, mm -hmm. and we don't know what's coming next. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, whether we want to hope for change or not hope for change, you have to have a vision of where we're going. So I just want to add that, that I really do appreciate Ron struggling with these issues very, very much. very important. Finish. Absolutely, seconds. sir. Ten seconds. Um, I just wanted the, this book ends right where Steve is right now, and I just wanted to mention it quickly. The, the Something that I saw in the in my sleep-deprived finish of the writing of this book is is that great thing that the 9-11 Commission says, you know, the failure ends up being um, a failure of imagination, failure to imagine the malevolence and ingenuity of our enemies. I think now our vulnerability as well is a failure of imagination, a failure to imagine the nation that we might yet become in this unfinished experiment. And with Obama now in the big white building, the power of the example from the United States in an era when power of example has never been more fierce as a force for change uh, is our greatest and maybe only hope uh, for real change. So thanks for listening. Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. I'm going to bring Ron out to the front of the uh, building. Thank you very much. And uh, go say hello out there. Don't, don't rush the front. Thanks.